morning, people interested in sound of heat pumps and welcome back after hopefully a successful and uh, enjoyable summer break. Today we have uh, a session on sound, sound emissions of heat pumps. We have probably one of the most knowledgeable panels we ever had. We will talk about the impact <clears throat> that, that heat pumps make on the built environment, on its users. Um, that is a, a byproduct of the comfort. Why is that important? And I should say it's quite a technical session. So if you uh, if you're listening in here, uh, you probably have to be equipped to learn about and to understand a bit of a technical terms. We have um, around 13 million heat pumps installed today in Europe, and the system integration strategy of the European Commission foresees that we should have 40% of all buildings in Europe heated by heat pumps in 2030. So within 10 years, we are about to quadruple the number of heat pumps installed. And something that may be called a technical problem today will certainly have an impact on the whole society because this system integration strategy is also foreseeing that the number of buildings equipped with heat pumps will increase to up to 70%. Personally, I would even say the number has to be a bit higher, but that doesn't matter. 50, 60, 70% by 2050, that means that a technical problem has impacts on human life unless we um, control it. And this is possible, and that's why we as an association have said, well, today it's not a big problem, um, it can be handled. It is really an issue that the end user has to ask and has to address with the installer. But if we have more heat pumps, then of course the uh, the potential problem may uh, may increase. And that's what we call uh, visible sound. There is quite often an issue if a heat pump is installed that people say, well, it's too loud, I can't sleep anymore, um, I'm getting a headache and so on and so forth. And, and very typical actually also people, the, 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 the construction company then says, well, we haven't even switched this unit on. So there is the thing between perception and reality of the impact that uh, should be part of the discussion today. We will be hearing from Johannes Bruckmann about the activities of the European Heat Pump Association. Johannes uh, has been the chair of our manufacturing committee for a very long time. He's now the vice chair, but that's not qualifying him. He's qualified much more due to his uh, education as an energy and process engineer. He has been working with Stiebel Eltron for a very long time. And if you allow me a personal remark, you will actually other guys that have these nice designs, or I would say the nicer designs of all the air source heat pumps in the market. And that's something I'm stressing all the time because I think apart from the sound emission, there is also a visual noise that is emitted by outside air units. And I think there can be uh, some improvement in that. Uh, he's also a member of the standardization body in the VDI. He's been very active in uh, writing standards to educate installers. And I think his quote is really that we can solve the issue if the end user asks the installer about it. It is really a question of understanding and of, of requesting a proper installation and design of the heat pump. But we will hear from him uh, himself and he will talk about um, our, the EHPA strategy on heat pumps and sound and will also explain a white paper that has been published just recently. Then he will be followed by Christoph Reichel. Christoph is working with the AIT in Austria. Uh, again, he's also a, a scientist and engineer. Uh, he has a vast knowledge in acoustics, aeroacoustics aero and fluid mechanics. And from the little I know about engineering, these are the topics where typically people start to run away, even the engineers. So, so we have, again, a very knowledgeable person. And that is recognized because he's also working in the IEA uh, Annex 51 on acoustic signatures of heat pumps. I like that title. It's an acoustic signature. It's not a problem. So, um, so we have signature additions in cars. I think we should we should look at that in heat pumps too. And he's member of the uh, heat pump panel in the renewable heating and cooling platform. So broadly exposed to what legislation and markets are doing when it comes to sound emissions from heat pumps. And now we go back to the details with uh, Michael Kraus our third engineer um, and he is he has been a researcher with the Nuremberg Institute of Technology so we're a very nice connection between researchers scientists and uh, the practical world because now he's the product manager for axial fence 
uh, with Zeal Abeck, one of the big manufacturers of uh, large and small fans uh, out of one of the SME pockets of Germany, where apparently everybody had the idea to develop fans because EBM Pabst uh, is also 15 kilometers away or something. And I think Helios is the third company that, so they all grouped around these three villages uh, somewhere in southern Germany. Anyhow, that's not what we want to talk about uh, with him. He will talk about um, how to make an, an air to water heat pump less intrusive, I should call it, because we won't, don't want to call it noisy. And I think I forgot to um, introduce Christoph's title. He will talk about acoustic behavior and the placement of heat pumps. This is um, it's a starting of a discussion. I think we have to look at this in the next years. And there is very, very interesting developments happening as we speak. So I hope that we can engage the, the audience to, uh, in, to, to, to participate in the debate. The chat box is open. Please send us questions because you rarely have so much knowledge on the sound issue in one room. We will end at uh, 11.22. And without any further ado, I give Johannes the floor. Please start with your presentation. And um, if you have immediate questions, please also put them in the chat box. If not, I would like to have the questions at the end. Um, and then I hope for an interesting hour and five minutes now. Johannes, please. Thank you much for the kind word, Thomas. And uh, I'm pleased to present the activities of the EHPA concerning sound. And um, we started this topic last year as we saw that we had some differences in the European countries and uh, the first step was a webinar that we had held in, in Vienna last year and uh, we had a full day session uh, with two sessions and uh, with uh, very interesting presentations on, on market, on physics, on uh, special issues that uh, manufacturers are tackling and uh, at the end of the full day we decided to to go to further actions and that's what i want to present today i have three examples for example from alexander speer of bwp he explained how the situations are in 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 germany and had some bad examples for example of baden württemberg or berlin the german countries how they tackle the the noise issue the BWP have some measures done in, in the past. They started with a sound guide that they published uh, in 2012 or 13. I, I'm not 100% sure. And afterwards, they integrated as well a sound calculator on their website where manufacturers declare maximum sound pressure values so that the, the customer can calculate the sound on site. Another example was that we got a presentation from Christoph Reichel, who will present the next, uh, have the next presentation. And uh, the Annex 51 is a, it's a, a program where measurement in the field and also acoustic investigations are done. And uh, we hope that we can get a lot of good results of this program. Uh, then, for example, another one was Pierre Poizat from Amazon, who showed how compressors work and which noises they are um, making and uh, how to improve the sound issue in heat pumps and avoid uh, vibration due to dampers or other other things. The outcome of this sound workshop was a white paper, as Thomas mentioned. And in the white paper, the, the manufacturer of the EHPA uh, did a clear statement on, on sound. And uh, there are four main points that they uh, worked out. First of all, the legal and regulatory considerations as we have the EN 12102 that is um, mandatory. Then the eco-design and energy labeling directive where 
manufacturer has to declare the the values for sound emission then we had a very big part of installation and con communication on sound especially to end customer and installer as well for planner and manufacturer and also authorities and uh, the the lack of uh, information is among the stakeholders was a quite big issue that we want want to mention and uh, as well the technical point was a uh, part of this white paper where we see very good innovations and uh, have improvements on uh, the the quality of sound and the quality of the heat pump itself that have also a quite big impact on the sound emission of heat pumps the next steps that we uh, want to do in the ehpa is to uh, investigate in the annex 51 uh, outcome where we have the acoustic signatures of heat pump and we want to use this outcome to to get better values that are comparable uh, in the for noise emissions of heat pumps and uh, the next step is hopefully that we can integrate such results in the in a revision of the en 12102 where we have uh, not the best values today and uh, late the the last point is that if that standard is revised that we can harmonize the european directive and national requirements so that we have a better situation in the in the market that is more transparent and clear so for example what do manufacturers and i can give you some ideas what stiebel eltron is doing so we have a, a, a website where we are um, dealing with sound and uh, we have a, a very a big sound calculator where the customer especially the installer can can calculate the sound 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 emissions on site there are some faqs and especially solutions for for the installation to avoid or to reduce the sound emission of heat pumps then in special situations where we have a installer or planner we have a special sound data for example the frequencies of the sound emission and uh, that's necessary for sound engineers that can calculate the sound on site as well then of course we have special trainings for our installer where they can can learn how to install units so that the noise is not disturbing the the neighbor or the end customer himself in Stiebel Eltron we have uh, two sounds lab sound laboratories where we can optimize our sound pressure and also measure measure tonality of heat pump products then in the development that's my part of in Stiebel Eltron is the uh, development of heat pumps and there we have uh, optimization of co components not only on efficiency and robustness also on on sound and vibrations and that especially for compressors ventilators pumps and sometimes also inverters we have special solutions for the market that we are producing for example indoor units where you can integrate in the air ducts silencer and so on and in that uh, units you have very low noises outside of the of the building <clears throat> and sometimes if necessary we have also better isolation that are adopted to the frequency of the sound emission for example a sound cover for compressors and a quite big issue is also the tightness of the units because if you have a tight unit you can avoid um, airborne noise for example and then uh, Stiebel Eltron is uh, very uh, engaged in investigation on new te technologies together with uh, universities institutes or specialized companies that are dealing with with sound or isolation and of course we try to uh, improve our the knowledge of our staff in trainings or in, in special projects 
now I come to the end and I'm often asked, what can the end customer do um, to avoid the disturbance uh, of noise to the neighbor or to themselves? And uh, what measures are, are possible? And my, my answer is always the same. It's not, not that difficult. It's quite easy. If the end customer and installer start to seriously address the issue of sound, they will find a solution and will not disturb neighbors or themselves and the, the unit is not that loud. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes. I think that's, that's a very strong statement. There is a bit of responsibility with the end user. Um, and I conclude that we are doing a lot at the moment to improve the products so that also the installer that is an important part of the decision-making process has all the tools available and is equipped with enough knowledge to answer that question that you put here. What does it? What measures do you take to avoid sound problems? So they can do something about it, right? Yes, they can can do a lot. They can uh, place the, the unit on the right position on the on the ground. So it's um, a bad idea to to place it on on the uh, neighbor's windows. Uh, well, sleeping rooms, uh, mostly you, you have the possibility to place it in, in front of the street. There is usually no, no sleeping room, for example. Then you have, as I mentioned, also the possibility to install an indoor unit where you can avoid uh, a lot of noises. And um, that are the, the points. And uh, most of the units, for example, have also uh, a silent modu modus where you can reduce uh, the speed of the fan and compressor during the night and uh, there is no usually no need to have the full speed also at night and uh, that that are measures that you can can use very good thank you uh, i don't see any immediate questions just now so we continue with christoph on the acoustic behavior and the placement of heat pumps. Please. Mm -hmm. So Thomas, I think, yes, this I need. OK. And this one. So Thomas, can you uh, tell me if you see the screen? So screen is visible? OK. Good. Sorry, I muted myself already. The screen is visible, <laughs> yes. Okay, then it's good. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for having the opportunity to give you some insights in the things we are doing here and in Austria and in the framework of the Annex 51. Thank you, Thomas, for introducing me so nicely. I will try to be efficient and try to um, avoid overcomplicated stuff. Uh, nevertheless, we have to deal with some, some things which I can clarify immediately or in the questions later on. So um, I will, after short motivation, which Thomas already gave, I will um, continue with two points today. So one will be the acoustic behavior of heat pumps, and I will show you some measurement techniques and some results, um, and then the placement assistance for heat pumps. Um, it will be a little bit about HVAC positioning and the current implementation of an app we are um, working on and the development and where we want to go with this. So uh, we already know that acoustic emissions have the potential to slow down our necessary market growth. We need the air to water heat pumps, also the other heat pumps. They play an important role to reach the climate goals. So we have to deal with acoustics in some way. And first of all, I want to show you um, this slide here. Um, out of the Annex 51, where we had uh, three units circulating through Europe at different institutes. The list you can see here on the slide, including France, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Sweden, and Austria. And uh, what we did here was measuring an air-to-water unit, so the uh, outdoor part of the air-to-water unit, in different acoustic environments, because the different institutes have different um, measurement equipment available, and also uh, in different operating positions. And uh, just one slide out of these measurements uh, is this one here. So what you see is for a special operating point uh, with the norm 14.5.11, the A-weighted sound power level for standard conditions 
uh, given in a frequency representation. So on the x-axis, we have the frequency band, the third octave band, and on the y-axis, we have the sound uh, power level. Uh, you don't see the, the, the real numbers, which we should not show, but what you can see is that one of these bars is 5 dBA. So you see that there are frequencies which are more prominent and there are frequencies which are not so prominent, but one of the important points here is also that all institutes here gave quite similar results. And you see that different methods in different acoustic rooms quite nicely reproduce the real thing, which is important, of course. Um, you can also see the directivity of this unit. So uh, what you can see here is that in special directions you get here, for example, a plus 3 dBA, whereas in opposite direction you have minus 3 dBA. So we can see out of this picture that we have around 6 dBA range of uh, sound power level or sound pressure levels if you calculate them on a special point. So this means that not every direction has the same effect on the environment, which you of course know. And this is not only in the sound power level, it's also if you look at the different frequency bands. So this means that some frequency would be maybe more pronounced in one direction, whereas other frequency bands are more pronounced in another direction, which makes the situation a little bit more complicated. If we go for measurements and, uh, for example, use something like acoustic domes, which means that you surround your unit with an array of microphones. So, for example, 64 microphones in some sort of sphere arrangement around the heat pump. This is a part of this acoustic dome, which you see here in this marketing graph. Then you can capture all the transient data. So this means you are not only going for calculating a sound a sound power level at one special situation. You go for a measurement on the whole operating range, on whole operating points, and you also see frosting and defrosting effects, which you can see here on the right side. You see here the defrosting of, an, of the evaporator, for example, here. Um, and if you do this, then you get, in addition to the typical climate chamber data, which is inlet temperature of the heat pump, uh, water part, the outlet temperature, the humidity of the climate chamber, so the outdoor situation, the temperature, you get additional information like the sound power level as a function of time. This is here and you immediately see that you have some parts where the sound pressure in this case, uh, or the sound power goes down. Uh, which is the defrosting part and the frosting part. And you also have here as a reference the weight of the heat pump. So uh, as you have the frosting cycle, of course, the heat pump gets heavier through the addition of ice. And this you can see in the lower graph. And I have made an enlargement of these two graphs. So the time is on the x-axis and we see the sound power level here in the first picture here. And it's quite high because it's an uh, experimental heat pump, which is completely open, more or less. And then here you have the, the weight and you see the weight increase and then you see the defrosting, the weight goes down and up and down again. And if you look at this graph here, you see uh, again the time. Uh, these are two defrosting cycles here, one and the second one. And on the y-axis, you have the frequency. So this is something which we call a waterfall diagram. So you can see which frequencies occur and how loud they are. And this I can show you in detail here. So what you have here is the frequency now on the x-axis. So these are the typical frequency bands. And on the y-axis, you have the time. And what you see here is that in a range of, let's say here's 80 minutes to, to uh, 180 minutes. So it's 100 minutes if you go from here to here that you see this is the area of frosting, that it's not only that the whole heat pump gets a little bit more louder, it's also that several frequency bands are excited, which are not there before. So if you have some transient effects, and this is completely dependent on the heat pump, of course, so different heat pumps different uh, operate differently and ex exhibit different effects. But in this case, we see, for example, that we get frequencies which are not there in the normal defrosted state. They are here if ice is going to accrete and more and more ice is there, then some frequencies come uh, add up and these frequencies which are additional there is something which you can hear and this can be a point where you get an awareness of the heat pump which is maybe not there so this means for us that it's not only necessary to look at let's say the typical operating point uh, shortly after defrost it's also interesting to see how these things develop over time 
And this is also can also be seen here quite nicely. So this is a typical defrosting cycle here. Or this is a completely different heat pump. But you see, if you look on the sound power level, you see that the sound power level goes up during icing. And then during defrosting, it goes down and then it goes up again. But again, this is dependent on the heat pump. Not every heat pump behaves the same way. Looking at this graph here, you see again the time on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis that you see that some frequencies are there which are going up and down again. So this is coming from spooling up and spooling down the compressor, spooling up and spooling down the fan. For example, here you can see quite nicely the spooling up of the compressor here, which you can also see in a very detailed diagram here. I, I know this is a lot to take in. <laughs> you have maybe time to get through the slides later on uh, and look at them again. But what you see is typical that it's not only a sound power level at a fixed point, it's a sound power level as a function of time we have to consider. And this is also uh, an adding up of frequencies. So if you look in the frequency range, you see that you have even over time some frequencies which are going up, going down. And this is all something which is linked to awareness. OK, so this was the first part. Second part is um, that I want to show you some current developments on an app or an, an add-on for mobile devices, which we are working on, which we think could be an interesting opportunity in some way. So uh, it's called HVIC Positioner at the moment, and it should not only deal with heat pumps, but heat pump is our main objective. And at the moment, also, the outdoor units are our main objective. So we are thinking about outdoor stuff here. And so what we want to do is give you the opportunity, if you have a handheld device of, let's say, some, not the oldest one, but the intermediate uh, mobile devices, then that you can use it to put a virtual heat pump at any place you want. So this means, if uh, linked to Thomas a little bit, you can also, if the heat pump is uh, the 3D model, a nice 3D model is in the database, that it means that you can really place the heat pump in front of your building, and you can look how this will look like. So this even means that you can go for the visual appearance. But it's not only visual appearance. If you have the virtual heat pump in your real environment, you can use it to calculate the sound propagation. And in our current implementation, this means that we go with the sound power level, which we have for the unit, neglecting frequencies and neglecting uh, directivity. And just look uh, if you position it in a corner or at a flat place that you use these typical formulas to calculate the sound pressure level. OK, so this was to show uh, just uh, how we are dealing with the acoustic data so that you can hear the heat pump. So this means we are recording this data on five channels. And then we use this data to make the heat pump audible. So if you go around in the acoustic app around the heat pump, you can hear how the heat pump will sound from different directions. And this one was to show that the standard is one of the standard measurement techniques which are used. That one of the standard uh, measurement techniques which are used already include directivity and frequency dependent information. So it's just this one number which is given on the label. But you have to get the number if you use intensity probe measurement. You have data from five phases which gives the directivity and data along the frequency, which you can use. And this was the, the final slide. One of those, uh, one of the information was that we have already one version of this application, which could be downloaded and used in Play Store and iOS Store. And the second one was the summary. And, and for the summary, it's that in the first part, I try to show you some innovative measurement techniques, which allow for time, space, and frequency resolved analysis. I showed you that heat pump perception is not only a matter of DBA. It's something where we should include thinking about frequencies and time dependence. Um, which And the third point, which is also a lot supported by Johannes, is that the manufacturers are doing very much at the moment already to get all the information and get all the things done correctly. Most important now, we have to correct, we have to look that we have correct installation and placement. That's important. 
you have this application which should allow, which at the, it is developed and it will de uh, develop more and more and should allow for virtually placing heat pumps in real environments, uh, which is able to calculate and visualize the sound pressure levels. And you can also hear your heat pump, which we are constantly updating. And next step would be including reflection and absorption on these virtual and real faces. And I think this, this will conclude my talk. Sorry for the acoustic problem. And um, thank you very much. We will manage. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, I think what, what we can conclude from your presentation is that we need lean and clean heat pumps. And then they, they change their behavior over time and they change also the sound behavior over time. But I see a lot has been done and, and is ongoing. Um, we will hear now from Michael what one of the component manufacturers is doing, because I guess what you have all understood by now is that this is an intricate problem. It's not only the heat pump itself, it's probably not only the fan itself, it's not only the compressor itself, it's actually something that is interactive with the environment, and since environments change, the sound signature changes. What, what can a fan manufacturer do? I, I, probably many people imagine, Michael, that the fan is the loudest part of the the heat pump so it's all your fault or we could make it more more friendly it's all your responsibility to solve this problem what what are you doing well thank you for the kind introduction and the question um well the question is how to make um a air to water heat pump um a little bit more silent and to um put down the sound signature and there's a lot of um ways to do that or a lot of things to consider when um, yeah, um, designing a heat pump or installing a heat pump. So first of all, let's um, yeah, take some considerations here, which um, affect um, both um, OEMs, which means heat pump manufacturers and fan manufacturers. We already heard um, from Johannes um, about the EN12102, um, yeah, whether with the eco design the energy labeling device and a question for us as a fan manufacturer is will there be a legislation for more quiet heat pumps additional uh, or, the, or adding to that and for us as a fan manufacturer um, yeah one of the most important legislatives is the ERP legislation the latest um, tier is the ERP 2015 and um, as most um, or as everybody knows there is a in discussion of a uh, of the next tier, the next efficiency step, let's put it that way. And yeah, the question is, when will it come? And when it comes, what will be the next efficiency threshold? This is, um, of course, a very important question because you can't um, optimize um, components on every aspect, which means sometimes you have to trade off between efficiency and sound. And um, for heat pumps, of course, sound is they're the most important value. But if you go a little more into detail, um, let's put some technical considerations here. If you are a heat pump manufacturer, you have to address several problems which can't be optimized at the same way or at the same yeah, extent. Um, either you optimize on acoustics and efficiency or you optimize on a very compact unit with a small footprint. You can't achieve the best acoustics and the most compact unit. This won't work um, by physical aspects, of course. And another problem a heat pump manufacturer has to address is, for example, sensitivity of icing of the fan during defrosting cycle versus tip clearance. I will come to the point later and explain in detail, but a, a bigger tip clearance, of course, um, leads to less sensitivity, but to higher acoustics. This is only a small aspect of all um, problems uh, heat pumps manufacturers have to address when they come to deal with fans. Yeah, what are the influence parameters on acoustics of a heat pump? Let's take um, a step back, possibly. Yeah, what do the customer hear? Yeah, my heat pump is too loud. Okay, um, it might be, but what are the what are the noise sources, possibly? Yeah. There are several aspects you have to address or to take, to take into consideration. Just as Christoph um, uh, said before, it might be that there is a, let's say, unfavorable installation on site. That you have, for example, a reflection of sound 
for example, um, on walls or corners, or is it a open space installation? It makes a difference, of course, um, for the noise perception. Further, um, if you have high back pressure levels or turbulences of air, this will create sound um, at your heat pump. Or what is possibly even worse, is a missing mechanical decoupling of the structure where you install the heat pump and the device, which means the heat pump itself. Coming a little bit to the um, manufacturer's part of fans, yeah, um, uh, possibly unfavorable design of heat pumps, especially in regards to the air path. Um, that might be, for example, that the fan itself is too loud. This is one noise source, of course. But there are also system influences, which means the built-in situation in the device. And this is what I want to address within the next few slides um, with a little bit more emphasis um, in regards to the air path. OK, let's um, put some, or what are the parameters which depend on the fan directly? This is, of course, the acoustic of the fan aerodynamics, which means blade design, and sometimes even the motor noise can be heard as the aerodynamics is that quiet that the motor can be heard sometimes. And sometimes there might be that you have an unbalanced fan. If it's a very cheap fan or not um, produced properly, then you might have vibrations from the fan due to some imbalance. It might be some icing effects as well. This is then during operation. And this is highly critical um, for the operation of a heat pump, as this is structure bore noise, which means the whole unit is then um, rattling and shaking. And this gives, of course, some noise if you have some imbalance here, um, which makes some structure bore noise. This is what comes from the fan. But if it comes to the design of the whole system, which means the heat pump, there's a lot of aspects you have to take into consideration. I'll only stress a few of them. For example, as I stated before, the tip clearance, which is um, the distance between the rotating and the steady part of a fan. I marked that with that red cycle here. Red cycle. And if we have a look on that, you can see um, on the x-axis a bigger tip clearance. And on the y-axis, you see the volume depicted in the color. You see that delta R LW, this is um, sound pressure, sound power level, um, A rated. And you can see the bigger you make the tip clearance, um, the louder um, the unit the louder gets. But why should you um, should you um, um, put for a bigger tip um, clearance? Put for a bigger, bigger tip clearance here. Um, this is to avoid icing during defrosting cycle, as if the tip clearance is bigger, then there is less chance that there the fan ices on the, the ices nozzle. On the nozzle. Sorry, there is some big some echo big on the on, on the acoustics here. For me, you're for me, you're perfectly here. So maybe it's on your side and you may want to continue. Can you try? I, I for sure will continue. Thank you. Um, as I just said, um, if you go for a bigger tip clearance to avoid icing of the fan, um, then you um, ha have very big, or then you can, then the fan gets louder up to three dB. And you have some influences on volume flow and pressure rise as well, which are negative, which are depicted in yellow and pink here. There are even some systems on the markets um, on market which state that they don't have any tip clearance, but even there, there's some clearance between the rotating and the steady part, and there can be icing during defrosting cycle, of course, as well. Then another big issue um, in regards of fan to make it more silent is the geometry of the nozzle, and this is quite impressive measurement data as well. We measured a fan in a full bell mouth, which is um, shown on the very top here, which is the ideal situation for a fan as a built-in situation in regards to the nozzle. Then a short bell mouth, which is builds a little bit yeah, less in axial direction. And we put it in a just a simple hole in a plate to measure it. It's the very same fan with the very same speed. 
but you can already see here at the characteristic curve, we see the pressure rise over the volume flow that the Fulber mouth makes a better acoustic, uh, a better um, characteristic curve, a better performance. If we have a look on the acoustics as well, then we first of all have to convert the stronger lines to the blue line. And this is what I did here. The, they are now have all the same operating points as then you can compare them 101. And now you get some impression of what you can yeah, do wrong or what can go wrong if um, the fan is put in the wrong nozzle. Yeah, you see um, the distance between um, two um, lines is 5 dB. This makes 5 dBA. And you see that the difference between the hole and the full bell mouth is more than 10 dB. And the difference between a short bell mouth and the full bell mouth is yeah, 3 to 4 dB. This is, this is a lot to um, as a surplus to a to the acoustic um, acoustics of a heat pump if you um, have 3 dB extra here. So the most critical thing is here to put um, a full bell mouth or a very good inflow situation to the to the fan, which can be guaranteed by a very good um, and high quality nozzle. Yeah, another system depending parameter is of course the position of the fan in the nozzle. It has to position in axial direction and radial direction in the correct way. I think this is quite clear. And what is one of the most important things when it comes to the operation of fan is the simple equation that turbulence is noise. It's as simple as that. Um, if you have any obstruction or turbulence on the suction, especially on the suction side or at the pressure side, um, this makes for higher noises. This can be a grill, a heat exchanger, or any strut of the device. The, the perfect situation would be if the air comes in like that. There are um, additional parts for fans as well on the market um, which um, straighten the flow um, in, at the very uh, at the inlet of the fan. But if you take into consideration that this is another yeah, um, place where icing can occur, and after all, um, it's just a patch to um, straighten the flow. And if you just would have built the unit a little bit bigger or um, avoid some turbulences in the unit, this would um, make up for a better performance than instead of putting say, some um, flow straightener in front of the fan here. Yeah, to conclude my short presentation here, you have to take into consideration um, the whole yeah, chain from the planner of the installer, the manufacturer of the heat pump and of the fans, of course, as well. And as um, Johannes and Christoph already said, you need a proper installation to exploit the full potential of heat pumps. But for sure, you need a proper design of the heat pumps to exploit the full potential of fans in a heat pump. Just as I showed, they are very influenced parameter, and this um, has to be addressed as well to go even to even lower sound power levels here. Thank you. Very interesting, Michael. Thank you very much also for the details, for the shape of the, the nozzle and uh, putting a fan directly uh, against the hole. That's not good. We have learned now. Uh, <laughs> I, what I would like to, to touch upon is that it seems that sound perception and being annoyed by sound is a very cultural phenomenon too. You, you haven't touched upon that too much, but I remember that I have been in Southern Europe and you see buildings where there is 80, 90 uh, heat exchangers stacked one upon the other and nobody complains. So it, it seems to be that is acceptable. And I would like to ask all of you, maybe starting with Johannes, uh, you are producing products for the whole world. Uh, and, and even you have opened the factory in China now. Do you experience that these differences in sound perception uh, are there and do they lead to different type of products? Yes, as you said, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we see big differences in, in, in other continents and also in, in Europe, for example, especially as one example, it's, it's Switzerland. They are very sensitive concerning noise and that's the reason why they quite often install indoor units to avoid noise 
to the outside. That's 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 clear, and uh, there are different differences in the in the units. As I mentioned, uh, an indoor unit, for example, or also outdoor units uh, that are differently designed uh, concerning noise. Uh, for example, as Michael explained, uh, it's depending on the on the size of the unit. A uh, bigger size is usually uh, so with the same capacity is usually uh, much quieter than uh, than an, a unit that is very small. And for sure, it's uh, it's also a question of the culture and uh, of of the uh, investment of a heat pump, of course. How do you see that in the Annex 51, Christoph? Do you, do you get input from different countries uh, that reflect this concern? I think uh, we already saw it in in the setup phase of the annex because normally if we set up an annex there is an annex idea and then you get a response of the different uh, operating agents and of the different uh, ex uh, members in these uh, in these meetings and you see it a little bit in the participant list so uh, in the participant list we see that we in this annex have only european countries uh, participating uh -huh. And this is also reflecting a little, a little bit the, the the thing what you said before. So we had not. Um, so normally, uh, to explain it in in that way, normally you, uh, um, as a country, you are participating in an annex if you have local ongoing research projects in this in this area. So this means um, if if countries don't don't have research projects in this area, they will normally not join the annex. This could mean that they are interested in acoustics, but they have no research projects running, which and they are no consortia are forming. But you see in the participant list quite nicely that it's a little bit not worldwide situation, yeah, as you said before, Thomas. But that is very interesting, Michael. Do you have do you sell different fans to Asia than you sell to Europe? Um, it strongly depends on the requirements of the customer, of course. There are customers um, requiring highest um, yeah, efficiency or there are other customers requiring highest uh, or lowest um, sound power level. Um, power level. It strongly depends um, on the customer. You can't really tell by a continent tell. or country. Um, but in general, yeah, most likely there are some c continents which don't stress the acoustics or to take that much emphasis on the acoustic um, signature as this is po for example in europe or in the usa yeah hmm. well let's look at uh, at standards T typically if something becomes a problem and you want to protect the customer then you will have to do something to standardize the approach you have shown that uh, the design of the heat pump and the positioning of the fan and the positioning of the outlet it makes for qu quite a complex system christoph has shown that the interaction with the outside environment adds to that and johannes has told us that in in sound sensitive countries people don't even want all this they just put everything inside so it's under their own control now you have mentioned the standard 12 uh, 12 uh, 102 and Christoph, you're working also, I guess, in, in the annex on a comparison of standards. And we have one question by Maximilian from uh, Bosch who says, what, what's the status of this? Will we see a better standard? But I would like to add to that, is it even possible to put such a complex situation inside a standard or will we fail? Because you can always argue that your specific situation cannot be standardized. So the standard value is not giving you a lot of information. How do you see that? Maybe you are uh, muted. Yeah. So sorry, my my microphone was muted. Um, <clears throat> I, I see a, a big improvement uh, coming from the Annex 51. I guess we will see, uh, especially the the point that tonality will have a quite big impact. And as we see today, uh, tonality is not an issue in the EN 12.1 or 2. And we hope that we will have. Uh, and secondly. The the point is that the EN twelve one or two has no uh, no point that you can uh, that is is running at the maximum speed and we hope that we will have in the future also with the outcome of the NX fifty one a comparable value that shows the customer the the maximum value that can occur but also integrating the tonality because an, a low uh, sound pressure value is not the only point that we will 
that uh, that will disturb the the customer because if you have a a ventilator for example it's not disturbing like a compressor if you compare that and the tonality is one point of that and uh, i see that the the nx51 is will end up in in autumn and we will get the results and then uh, it takes some time to to revise the en uh, 12 one or two i guess that's for minimum two years and another time that we need for harmonizing the this, uh, directives of the european union so five years minimum uh, that's roughly the the timeline i would estimate okay i think that that is uh, that is something we have to address also i'm saying that as the secretary general of this association because if the commission is right and we will really speed up the deployment of heat pumps so quickly and we will do everything that this is happening and that means in within five years we have already 20 million or similar heat pumps and 90 percent of them are air source so the issue will not disappear but on this topic christoph you you are in the annex do you what, what do you perceive what will be the impact of the annex on the legislation process and standardization so uh, I think the, the, the most nice information on this is that uh, the people who are involved in the annex are quite heavily involved in the in the standard. So Francois Bessac and Michel Mondot are quite deeply involved. So this means that they can directly draw the information from the annex into, into their work. Um, mm -hmm. We are now at the moment finalizing all these documents and uh, I had not the chance to look at the, at the documents which are which is not maybe now the, the one which I should uh, cite and it should also maybe um, we should wait for this refuement process but in the end it's like that as as thomas said that or as johannes said that we are finalizing our documents or uh, now and they will go to the review of uh, of the excos and then we'll have the documents ready and they will be all available for free download so um i hope that so i cannot give more information now at the moment we have our measurements we know what what we saw and uh, and and i'm not the one who is who's generating the documents because this is on in france and michel and francois are working on this so yeah. um I think we will get some nice results quite quite in, in short term here because this will okay. end this year <laughs> so so then i can only repeat to everybody also in the audience this is not uh, the end of a discussion this is this, this continuous process that we are all working on and what you should take home is that the industry is taking this very seriously michael what do you think is, is the problem too complex to put it in a standard or can it be done Really hard to tell as I'm not involved um, in the legislation or in the annex. But still, if you have the possibility to um, put at least some standard which sharpens the requirements, well, not the very last detail, but at least a little bit more, a little bit better, then possibly that might, that might be a beginning, but not the end. As you said, it's a beginning of a discussion and not um, the end and the solution which um, will then be valid for the next 100 years. Yeah. Let, let's go back maybe to the consumer. Um, Christoph, you, you showed this quite impressive tool um, and it is available for end users, but is it known enough? Is, is this something that maybe, is it, is, it, is it marketed enough from your side and maybe should it be uh, handed out as a, an opportunity to an end user? If Johannes says, well, you know, ask your installer, then the end user needs to be equipped to ask proper questions. Yeah, so there are there are several way, ways. So one thing is that we have at the moment a, a research project running, which is in the end of the first year. It's a, a two years project. So most of the things which I now showed as development goals will be available end of next year. So this means this is our framework where we are working on the current version. So for testing and seeing how this all works is already available. Uh, we are not really marketing it. As you as you maybe proposed, so it, it's on our homepage. You can see it. Yeah, we are in all our situations where we show it. We give some links yeah, to some people who can who can download it and try it and test it. Uh, but I think it has a lot of potential. It even has the potential to be a, a, a tool where you can see how different units would be from an optical point of view if if they if you like them. Yeah. <laughs> but what is even that? Yeah. But the most important thing is I think that we should try to get links between the apps which maybe manufacturers have so that manufacturer apps which are already there most probably can link to some acoustic features and so to interlink this more and more so at the moment our link is here because it's free so um 
if if manufacturers are are getting involved and want to have uh, nice 3D models and have uh, a lot of um, have more sophisticated data inside the app, then we are going into some some discussions with them because at the moment we are drawing only the information of the sound power level from the label, which is not much information. It's just one number. But as I show, there is frequency dependence. There is a little bit time dependence. There is directivity. So this is not there. So if you want to if you want to have this in an application like this, we have to make this in some bilateral way to get information into the app. So, so you, if I give you these five seconds of marketing, if a manufacturer says, I have the silent heat pump in the world, uh, how much effort do they have to make to prove that via U2? So we are normally only using the data, which is from some certified measurements, of course, yeah, yeah. because if you put zero in DBA there, then it's quite easy because then you have no sound pressure level anywhere. Yeah, that's clear. So what we are using at the moment is the label data. Um, and then, of course, it's a matter of where is the data coming from. Yeah? Of course, this is something we have to look at. But but yeah, so that's why I'm asking. If I would if I would want to show that I am better, that or I want to market it as that, then I would have to send you a machine or somebody that you put into one of these rooms with all these microphones around. That that's still one of the most impressive pictures for me. And then you would measure it and you would say, okay, we take this data that we are sure is happening and put it into our tool. And only then yeah, can you not, give more precise. Yeah, but it's not necessary to have this measurement at our place. Because if you yeah. use an intensity measurement, then the intensity measurement, if a standardized one, then it's this data is enough. So I showed this graph with the whole with a lot of numbers. If you have this, then you have all you need. And this okay. uh, this you can do at all these institutes which are available, of course. And if you do this in a certified measurement, you have the certified data sheet. I think it's a little bit of a problem that this data is normally not given, if I understood this right, during a certification to the customer. Because normally it's really this one number which is the result. So I think mm -hmm. there is maybe a discussion in the process. So what do I get what? if I make a certified measurement? What do I get for data and how can I use it later on? This is maybe mm -hmm. not completely clear. Yeah? If you really get it, for example, for these five phases separately, yeah? because you need for a directivity, you need top, bot, top left, right, and so on. So this is made because you always get the frequency integrated and the uh, uh, space integrated data, but the data is available normally. Yeah? So this is, I do, think do there is a the process here. Hmm? Yeah, uh, Michael, do you use the same approach? Do you also, do you also consider these uh, sound emission over time of, of your devices, of the pans? No, we do. We measure um, usually um, steady state and not transient um, conditions. This is what you see in catalogs of all um, manufacturers, because this then strongly, of course, depends on the built-in situation if you would um, address um, transient operation, of course, just as um, Christoph said. This is really dependent on the device then. Yeah. One question I had for you. Do you think we are at the end of this development? I mean, from a fan perspective, in the past we had we had quite a few new things. There was shaping according to the old feathers and you showed the different in and out latch shapes. I think that was the latest big innovation that was also marketed at fairs. Is there still a lot of things in your repository, or is this pretty much developed to an endpoint? Well, um, if we um, address the um, sound um, in this case, I would say there are already a lot of very, very good solutions on the market with um, very low sound power um, emission here. But sometimes you get the impression that um, a low price um, at installation is more important than low acoustics. But to mm -hmm. answer the question um, from a technical um, side of view, um, it's hard to tell where we can go, of course. We see potential in the current technology, um, especially if we optimize a system even more, even further, if we put more emphasis to the sound and not to the um, compactness, for example. And then we um, think that even with the current technology, we will be able to um, reduce sound power emission here, or sound emission, after all. Um, regarding the development pipeline, well, I do expect improvements um, in the future, but this won't be um, technology leaps. It will be incremental steps because we are on an asymptotic curve here and there is barely any um, reserve um, to the best case you can think in terms of physics. So this is, yeah, we expect um, incremental improvements here from the fan side of you, as, at least if you only talk about the fan. And yeah, a general um, statement here, um, 
yeah, with the rising um, amount of heat pumps, of course, yeah, to have to think to um, put that down. Yeah, um, operating two heat pumps or two fans next to each other is plus three dB um, on the emission of sound. So, um, yeah, this um, is, um, of course, a topic we have to address um, quite quickly if we hear the numbers you already stated, Thomas. Well, let, let's let's be uh, innovative and future orientated. There's a lot of debate on IoT in other discussions, not so much on heat pumps. It seems it hasn't arrived at that level yet. But if I imagine that I have a, a, a built environment where there is an air source heat pump in every house, are there any concepts, and that's really a question to all of you, that connect the different heat pumps? I have heard things where where there was a the consideration of a microphone in one heat pump that could actually adjust the speed of the fan based on the outside lowest noise that this perceives. So, okay, eight o'clock, the street noise increases, and you could say then you can run the heat pump at full speed because nobody cares anyhow. But you could also make a sound array around uh, a set of installed heat pumps, but of course they would have to be able to talk to each other. How is that? How is the development status of such uh, such an idea? So no to, to break the, the, the silence, <laughs> uh, is the only thing I can uh, say at the moment is that we have also set up an annex in, in this way. It's it's the IoT annex. It's an another annex, which is not the acoustic one. And they are, I think they are also thinking a little bit of acoustics there. But this IoT coming, bringing IoT to heat pump is something which is all a little bit addressed in this in this annex as well, which is has now started, I think, for it's running for half a year or so. Okay. Well, it's not a good answer, but it's at least there is something. So no, I from, mean, yeah, from ahead. manufacturer side, uh, IoT is quite an uh, um, important issue that we are tackling and uh, working on. But uh, the, the the IoT um, connected with other heat pumps to avoid uh, noise is not a part of our work today. So. That's uh, quite a new aspect, and uh, I think uh, one of the biggest problem in that way is that you have um, different manufacturers and different brands of, of heat pumps that has to to speak with with each other. And I guess that's quite big problem to solve in the future. So we are mm -hmm. at the very beginning here. Michael, do you have sensors inside your fans? Yes, we do have, and we can even um, put them to a cloud where they can be read out um, by the customer or um, by the OEM. And there's um, as well the possibility to bring um, whole devices in that cloud that you can check or at least um, sample the data there and then put some algorithms over that. That is even okay. um, reality today. Maybe there is opportunity. You, you'd say there is a little, some sort of preparedness level that can be used better in the future. It is at least um, some um, preparedness here. It's um, in the in case of heat pumps, of course, or um, putting that um, a proposal you just um, proposed um, to make the heat pumps communicate is a big leap forward here. But at least sampling the data, what is what is running, what are the operational data, this is already possible today. Yeah. Okay. We have two questions from the audience, very specific ones. One um, or to uh, to Johannes, I guess I would say, is by Thomas Martin, uh, and he asks, putting heat pumps out indoor might solve the problem of the neighbors, but what about the the noise inside the house? Structural noise, uh, noise that is transferred via your concrete core that's making you crazy. Is that a problem that you see, especially in smaller houses or smaller flats? Um, that's a quite good question and uh, that's our daily work because also brine to water heat pumps have the same problem because there's also installed a compressor making uh, a lot of vibration and uh, especially for the new technologies with an inverter and uh, um, inverter driven heat pumps where you can adjust the capacity you have uh, different frequencies and you have to avoid the natural frequencies of the, the units. And what we do is, for example, that we are in our um, units itself, we have uh, a lot of damper. We have dampers for, for the hoses that were installed uh, in the past outside. They are installed 
today inside the unit and um, also the the frequency will will test it uh, yeah frequency by frequency of the whole range and uh, that is really our daily business and uh, the the problem is, is mentioned uh, especially in lightweight con constructions there you have to to maintain especially these this issue but uh, also there you have uh, new technologies where you can um, um, decouple the vibration to the to the ground and uh, the positive thing is that usually the new buildings are better isolated and needs less capacity and smaller units and usually smaller units are less noisy so that's the the advantage uh, that we have in that field Thank you. And another question, that would be the last one uh, that goes to Christoph and Michael. Um, is there research on the AIT side and experience on the producer manufacturer side on the impact of aging uh, on the quality of the fans and noise development? I know that aging was that in the in the setting of, during the setup of the annex um, this was brought in by the british by the british part they discussed about aging of of units so my we have it not in the annex because we have, we have also, not, annex, uh, we have also written not the annex uh, but uh, i know that they are dealing with this a little bit okay michael do you have any experience the fan blades do they break after 20 years no they don't um there is um a lot of intensive testing that the blades um can bear any operational condition in 20 years or at least at the um time guaranteed by the manufacturer this is of course tested intensively in any laboratory of any renomed um fan manufacturer of course hmm. so i think well, it's thank you very much yeah yep. Please. i, I no, would not, i would expect uh, the the dust aggregation uh, from the heat exchanger as a as an interesting part so i think i would not so much see the fan i would more see the the, the blades of the heat exchangers that if they get more and more dirty they are maybe more prone to icing something like this but it's just speculating so we don't have a research work on this but we would do some if interest <laughs> exists <laughs> okay so so maximilian you know where to go um, then thank you very much, Michael, Johannes, Christoph. At least for me, that was a very educational and very interesting um, seminar. I think we have kept the attention of more than 100 people, which is also very good, especially since, uh, as I said, I, I'm sensing a bit of a online seminar fatigue. Um, this is ongoing. So all of you in the audience that find there is more questions that need to be asked and answered, please contact the speakers. I guess you're all available for additional interchange. And if you want to do it on a more um, institutional level, join the annexes of the International Energy Agency. Talk to your installers to avoid these problems because we have heard from Johannes that the installer is a main gatekeeper in this. Install the product that Christoph has done and check for high quality fans of, of renowned manufacturers. I guess these are three steps that everybody can do already immediately and we will not stop addressing this problem so that we can silently provide renewable energy to the world. Thank you very much and have a nice day and see you at the next seminar that you can find the details on the EHPA website. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.